Okay. Okay.
Okay. We're going to get started with number 30 in our hymn books, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, number 30. Let's all stand as we sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Number 30 in our hymn books. Let's sing that second stanza together. For my part in this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus on that last stanza this is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Excellent job, Hannah Joy. All righty. Amen. You should have seen the look I got. All right. No, oh, she did a fantastic job. Come on up here, boys and girls. Let's sing a song together. We're going to sing I'm in right out, right up, right down, right. Happy all the time. Y'all know that one? All righty. Let's, uh, let's do the finger thing here. Let me see. Where's your pointers? Let me see some pointer fingers. In right, out right, up right, down right. Happy all the time. You got it? Let me see some pointers. Ready? Here we go. Hazel Grace, you want me to hold your dolly for you? I can hold it for you. Thank you. All righty. 
Ready? In right, out right, up right, down right. Happy all the time. Okay, here we go. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in and cleansed my heart from sin, I'm ready. In right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. Excellent job, good singing. All right, there you go. Here's the grace. Very good singing today. All right, good job. See you later, guys and gals. All right. Oh, good singing. All right. See y'all later. Ooh. How you doing, Brother Ryan? Good. All right. So nice to see you all today. We have an outline. It's the same outline that you saw last week, and the week before, and the week before. So if you have one, great. If not, i got plenty of them here. So uh, Brother Andrew will have them. So if you need one, please help yourself. And it is, let's see here. Hey, I will get to... Uh, let you know that Brother Gary Kastner was preaching down in Texas today. I saw the live stream on Facebook this morning. He's down in uh, Pastor it now, down in, out in the Houston area, extreme north Houston. And uh, so we're pretty happy for him. Brother Nat Williams is uh, in Thailand, hanging out in a motel while he's quarantining. And he'll be finishing up with that real soon. And uh, was texting... Uh, or getting, I was just reading a text from uh, Brother uh, uh, Brother Reiner Harper just the other day, and he's doing really well out there in uh, out there in San Diego area with the chaplaincy and and uh, <clears throat> such a blessing with the technologies that we have nowadays to be able to keep in contact with so many uh, missionaries and preachers all throughout the world. And uh, was, uh, let me just read this while I'm at it too, and that is. Uh, this was just posted this morning. Uh, Sister Janet Brinkley uh, there in uh, Perth, um, Scotland, she writes uh, on her Facebook page, uh, Day 3, Kent, in reference to Kent Gossmeyer, Kent is now home and doing really well. Of course, he donated a kidney, and so he's out of the hospital. He's happy to be back under the care of his beautiful wife, Andrea. Dylan is very happy to have all tubes and lines out today. He said he feels like a free man. His pain has lessened and he's walking long distance. He will come home Tuesday. And that is a real blessing. He, they posted some pictures, of course. So Brother Kent is home. And uh, do pray for, uh, pray for Dylan. Of course, he has been dealing with this kidney disease a long, long time. And uh, so he's very happy to have that transplant so I uh, do pray for his recovery. That's such a blessing uh, for these two families to hear this, uh, this great news. So uh, amen. All right, let me get back to uh, my spot here for Sunday school. I think that's this button right there. Uh, yes, it is. All righty. And uh, we have been talking about doctrine. We're kind of in the middle um, uh, before we start uh, on the doctrine of, uh, of bibliology, doctrine of the Bible. We're gonna take, we've been taking a little bit of time and just talking about doctrine in general, and talking primarily about warnings and things like that that the Scripture um, extends to us. And we've been focusing a lot of our attention, of course, in 1 Timothy. So I do invite your attention over to 1 Timothy. And um, the, uh, we've been walking our way down through those, those final verses in that section there. We looked at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verse number nine, 19. That was several weeks ago. I think it's been a month already. It talked about holding faith and that importance of of getting a getting a a, a real firm grip uh, on our doctrine. It's not just holding as in um, you know this is what this is what we believe. Like we have some kind of list, some you know doctrinal list that we all uh, you know say that we believe in. This is a you know holding on to is more of a passionate type of thing where we take ownership of it. And this is this is what we believe. Um, you know, um, this, this past week, um, I, st I just started reading um, 
uh, the, uh, the Trail of Blood. Now, many of you have read that book. I've handed out several copies over the last couple of weeks and probably 100 or so copies in all my life. Uh, I give, I, you know, I get those. Uh, we get them. We buy them from Challenge Press. Uh, Lehigh Valley Baptist Church bought Challenge Press a couple years ago, so they publish them now so I can get them, I can get them discount, you know. But um, we've been buying them for years, and we just give them away. Uh, of course, here at the church, we don't charge anybody for anything as far as literature goes. But uh, it's probably, I'm just thinking, I was trying to think back when the last time I read that book, and it's probably been 25, maybe even 30 years. I think the last time I read it was actually out in Missouri. And uh, so it's been a long time. I've read excerpts out of it. So I, I was, I was uh, uh, handed somebody a copy the other day here at church, and I thought to myself, man, I haven't read that in a while. So I started reading it. And the first, uh, first couple chapters um, go through and talk about um, the distinctive uh, doctrine of Baptist. And uh, what a, I mean, what a great section. It was just a couple pages, but it lays out some things that, um, the, that, are, um, that define doctrinally where we stand at as independent Baptist. And uh, it's just so important because there's a lot of folks that sit in churches that have never heard those doctrines, literally never heard from the Word of God uh, the doctrines that we so belovedly hold to. And it's because they're not taught, they're not preached. Folks don't, uh, a lot, for often is the case, folks don't read their Bibles or doctrines are explained away as either being obsolete or replaced by something else as if we have the opportunity of, re, of changing God's word and his doctrine. And, um, you know, that sounds kind of ridiculous to us, but that's the reality of many churches where they sit down with their synods or their presbytery or their, or their conferences and, and actually take a vote and determine what their doctrine's going to be. We don't do that. We look in the Bible and says, thus saith the Lord. And what's the Bible say? That's our doctrine. This book is our sole authority on doctrine and on practice, both uh, as corporately as a church, but also personally, individually. This is what we hold to. We hold to nothing else. Um, uh, the Bible and the Bible only. Uh, what is that Latin term? Is it solus biblius or something like that? That was like the cry. I forget. I'm not up on my Latin. E pluribus unum. I don't know. But um, um, I can't even order a sandwich in Latin. But who would want to anyway, you know? Um, the, um, the reality of it is, is that position cost a lot of people their lives um, centuries ago, that idea of being a Bible and Bible only because that was not a popular position. And, uh, and so we have held to that, Baptists have held to that uh, for a very long time, and, um, and we still hold to that today. And so um, uh, anyway, I, was, I just started reading through the book again. I haven't read it in a long time. It's a short book. If you've never read The Trail of Blood, and uh, you'd like a copy. Um, I, you know, I bought a half a dozen uh, a week or so ago. I've given away a few already. I've got a couple more. We can always get more. But if you've never read that book and you'd like a copy, please let me know. It's a history of the Baptist uh, from the times of Christ all the way up through. Um, I mean, I, when he wrote that, he was uh, early 1900s, I think, when, uh, when Carol passed away. This is not... Uh, uh, Brother Stephen and I were just talking about him the other day. It's not B.H. Carroll. It's the other Carroll. There's two Carrolls out there. B.H. Carroll wrote Ecclesia. He wrote that book, Ecclesia, which I got a copy of too, which is excellent, the book on church doctrine. But uh, it's the other Carroll, J.M. Carroll, I think it is. And so uh, if you've never read that book and you would like a copy, please let me know and I will get you a copy. And uh, you can read that for yourself. It's a tremendous uh, account of the of the history of Baptists is called the Trail of Blood because of the persecution that Baptists have had suf have suffered uh, for millennia now and the persecutions that we've received not only um, uh, not only uh, from the Catholic Church of course that was the main part of it throughout the Dark Ages uh, but even through the uh, Protestant Reformation and uh, a lot of folks like to uh, lay a lot of platitudes at the feet of the Protestants but the Protestants were uh, um, uh, were persecutors of the early Baptists, especially the Presbyterians there in Switzerland, and even in this country, as uh, Baptists suffered at the hand in America here, suffered colonial America suffered at the hands of the Episcopals uh, and and other congregational groups uh, in the early parts of our our nation, 
uh, when, you know, there was, there was no separation of church and state back then. And, of course, if you were a Baptist, you believed in separation of church and state. That, one of the reasons why our country holds to separation of church and state, whether you like that term or not, is because they got it from independent Baptists. Uh, and that's where that, um, that polit- what's that? New Jersey was a big part of it. Uh, um, the, um, of course, Rhode Island, of course, uh, Baptist colony, um, Thomas Jefferson had, um, had been exposed to, the, um, to many Baptists when he was down in Virginia. Um, of course, the Quakers were in Pennsylvania, but New Jersey, and one of the things you'll see in New Jersey, and that's why we have churches, Baptist churches, dating back to the, to the mid-1700s here in, this, in the state of New Jersey, is because there was an extreme freedom of religion, and the Baptists were a forefront of that. And so certainly here in New Jersey, you know, actually in New Jersey, you actually used to be split this way instead of this way. It was East and West Jersey instead of North and South. I'm a South Jersey person myself, which has to do with scrapple and pork roll, okay? We all know that, all right? And, and so, um, amen. Um, no Taylor Ham in our house, just telling you. Um, so the, um, the reality of it is, is that Baptists have a tremendous history and have impacted a lot of, a lot of nations over the years but not because we influence them politically. We inst- influence them through our doctrine. Doctrine makes all the difference. And so we've been talking about doctrine and holding on to sound doctrine, and, uh, and so I'm never going to finish this if I keep talking. All right, I know that. I'm sorry. Uh, no, actually, I'm not sorry. I'm just going to keep talking. But we're all, we made it all the way down to the end of this, and I, I want to direct your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 3. And uh, if you would go with me there, please, I'm just going to read uh, those couple verses, 3 through 7, and uh, uh, 1 chap- Timothy chapter 1, verse number 3, through verse number 7, where it says, and I besought you to abide still in, uh, let me see, am I in the right, yep, I'm in the right place, still in Ephesus, um, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. It was interesting, Brother, uh, uh, Brother Reiner Harper uh, in his Facebook post this morning, of course he's a chaplain out there in San Diego and his devotions, I guess he posts, he does some commentary about some of his devotions and posts them. He wrote something the other day um, on his Facebook page, or let me see, I, that was something he, something he said, sent out via email, a comment that he got from one of, the, uh, one of the Marines out there who said to him, he says, you're different than all the other chaplains that are here. He says, you use your Bible a lot, and you don't curse. <laughs> Go figure, all right? Anyway, shall I continue? Verse number six, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for your precious word and, Lord, the truth that we find in it. And I'm so thankful, dear Father, for the, um, the truth that gives us um, eternal life. It sets us free free from the bondage of sin and the curse of the law. And I'm so thankful, dear Father, that uh, we have the opportunity and but also, Lord, the responsibility of understanding doctrine and to hold to those things, to hold firm on truth and to to promote this truth, uh, not just to justify our existence as a church, Father, but we know that true doctrine... um, Will, ch- will change people's lives, will transform them, um, give them a new birth, and then make them stand firm in Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray that we would, of all people, Lord, that we would be most diligent um, to see that this ministry that we have is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, Father, bless the time we have together this day that you use it for the furtherance of the gospel for the strengthening of the saints of God, and for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, the Bible talks about swerving here, and that's what it says in, um, in verse number six, from which uh, some having swerved have turned aside on the vain jangling. 
And so this is kind of this is where we're at as we've been working our way through these verses. Each one is talking about responsibility and doctrine. That word swerve, um, I think we kind of understand what that means if you're driving. Um, we were driving to church today, and thankfully, um, you know, uh, Hannah Joy did a great job. She's learned. She's, she's doing really good, okay? Got a driving test coming up in a couple weeks, right? So we were driving to, and, and what did we run across today? Not just a bicyclist, okay? You should never hit bicyclists, okay? There's a law in the state of New Jersey about that. But uh, what else was in the middle of the road? A turtle, okay? And, um, and so she, she noticed it as we were, like, right on top of it when she said, that's not a rock, okay? <laughs> All right? When, when the little head sticks up and going, what's this, you know? Thankfully, it was, you know, between the tires. So uh, um, now, how, okay, how many of you, when you were learning how to drive, got the speech about swerving? I know you got, all of my kids got the speech. You got the speech? Tell me the speech, brother. What's the speech? Okay, you don't swerve. Yeah, <laughs> this, you're irreplaceable, brother. It's not about you, it's about the car, brother. I'm just letting you know, your, your folks didn't say that, did they? Amen, all right. So, yeah, that's exactly the speech, all right? Because, uh, you know, um, certain things are not replaceable, all right? And people are one of them. Um, you know, I, I remember learning how to drive. Um, I don't remember getting the speech, okay? I just got to say this, all right? I don't know if my folks are listening to the, to the um, live stream this morning. If they are, sorry, Mom and Dad. But I don't remember getting the speech because I remember shortly after getting my driver's license, I was a young driver. I was probably 17. I don't think I was 18 yet. I was probably just 17. And uh, Joyce and I used to bowl on Saturday mornings, you know. And so there was a couple other folks we used to pick up on the way to the bowling alley. I remember driving through, uh, I think it's Ashburn Hills or one of the developments there. I lived in suburbia in Delaware. And uh, picking them up in the car, my folks had a Ford LTD station wagon, okay. These things were boats, all right? And uh, I remember picking up a, a couple folks in the car. They're sitting in the back. Joyce is sitting over there. The, the bench seat in the front, she was probably sitting right next to me. That's what, that, that knew, they knew how to make cars back then, okay? And so, uh, so I'm driving, and a dog runs right out in the road. It was a beagle. I remember that because at that moment, your whole life flashes in front of your eyes, all right? And there's this beagle. That's, and, uh, and so... I, I got the, I'm, I'm in this boat, you know, and the, be, the beagle jumps out in front of me, and the first thing I do is go, Arp! and if you've ever driven a Ford LTD station wagon, they don't like it when you go, Arp! because that back end goes, whoa, and then you're going, and the back end's going, whoa, and this thing is just going down the road like this, whoo, and all of a sudden the back end just flips around, and there's this telephone pole right there, and it goes, Arp! Every time I tell this story, I get closer to the phone pole, okay? And um, it was at that moment where I gave myself the speech. The next dog that runs that in front of me is going to die, okay? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I learned my lesson right there. And uh, any, every, when, I, when I taught all our kids to drive, I, I, gave them, I gave them the speech. They probably heard the story. Because, uh, you know, with, when, I, when I taught Buzz, I'm sure I was that far from the phone pole. By the time I got to Chris, I was like, it was inches, I tell you. And um, <clears throat> anyway, um, you, I think we all got the idea what swerving does. Okay? It can cause some serious problems. So when we see this term being used in the scriptures in reference to doctrine, it, it, uh, the word itself is... This idea of deviating off of a, of a path, um, having no aim. You know, when, 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 the, when you're in a car in particular and you swerve uh, to miss something, all of a sudden, you know, you kind of lose control of it. You're not really sure what's going to happen next, what direction you're going to end up in. So this, this word is used here to give this idea of, of a dilemma, of, of choosing to do something. Because this... This is, not, this is not by accident. This is not an accidental kind of word. You're making the choice to do this. You're going to swerve. You're going to do something. And so, um, and so I, I asked my... Uh, I was out at this preacher's conference a few weeks ago out there in Missouri, and one of the, one of the pastors that was out there... It's Brother Ball, right? Is that what it... From Lebanon, Missouri? That was a great message. And, uh, 
um, he just he preached a really simple message that was entitled "Don't Swerve," and uh, he preached from this text. It was wonderful. Uh, I sure enjoyed it. It was it was um, it was a very encouraging message. Um, but you know, of course, it, it, for myself, I kind of, it kind of begs the question: you know, why would people swerve? And we're talking about doctrine here, and. Um, so, you know, when you think about it in a, in, a, in, a, in a real sense, like, for instance, if a beagle runs out in front of you, uh, or a turtle, uh, here in Jersey, if, if a deer runs out in front of you, or a turkey or something, um, you, you often, you react to an obstacle. So often that's what swerving does, you're reacting to something. And, and so, you know, when I was thinking about that, um, Brother Mike, you and I were talking about um, Charles Darwin. Was it this past week? Okay. That was a swerve. Okay. Uh, back in, um, um, back in, the, in the, with the 1850s, Charles Darwin, of course, released his uh, Origin, of the Th- uh, Origin of the Species uh, book and uh, it turned the scientific world up, upside down, but also turned the theological world upside down. And, of course, you and I, we made that observation. A lot of the theology works that came out towards the end of the late 1800s into the early 1900s. How many of you have a Schofield reference Bible in front of you today? Anybody? Okay. All right. That's kind of like the standard. Everybody had Schofield Bibles. Even Schofield swerved, okay? Because all of a sudden, you have this this science, all right? I just want to remind you, the Bible even warns about this, okay? Science so-called, right? They, all of a sudden, the science was out there, and all these theologians are thinking, what do we do with this? And then, then all of a sudden, you have the swerve. You have theistic evolution being taught. And you got this day-age stuff being taught. You got, yeah, gap theory being taught. All this stuff was a result of swerving. There was an obstacle that was thrown out there, and they didn't know what to do. So instead of just running it over with the front tires, they said, oh, no. And all of a sudden, we got all this garbage. Now, there's a problem with that. First of all, it, 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 it diminishes trust in the scriptures, OK? Because The Bible says this, 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 and this, but now you're saying, well, it says this, but it really means this. So you diminish diminish the trust in the scriptures. But then you've got all these other doctrines that you've got to deal with, like, for instance, the fall of man into sin. So if if you have a day-age thing where you have mankind evolving over millions of and millions of years, then when does man fall into sin? Do you, do you, and so if, if mankind eventually becomes sinful, well, how, did we, I don't know, did we, we didn't talk about this. We didn't talk about imputation, the doctrine of imputation. When is sin, when does mankind become guilty? That's a big deal. And, and so, all of a sudden, doctrines like, um, like when mankind becomes sinful, when does is, when is sin uh, become, uh, when we, we, do we become guilty? What does it mean to have a sinful nature? All those things that were nailed down to Genesis chapter 3, I mean nailed down to, all of a sudden you pull the nail out. And all these doctrines all of a sudden are afloat. And there's no answer for it. And so, you don't know, when you start swerving, you have no idea what you're going to run into. And and so, they reacted. Um, A lot of theologians reacted to that. And, you know, it took a while for the dust to settle and for folks to say, you know, this is not necessarily true. Darwin may not have all his his screws down tight on this one. And it it took years for good, sound preachers of the gospel to stand up and say, no, we don't buy this. This is not the way it has to be simply because this man says so. And they, they tried to get back on the, on the right road. 
And so swerving is often due to obstacles. And, and the obstacles that are out there, like for instance, you know, um, if it's an animal like, you know, like I'm just telling with the kids and stuff, and you've heard it too, sometimes it's better to just plow it over because you can replace the, you know, the front end of your car but, or your windshield, but you're not going to replace your life when you wrap it around a foam pole uh, and they're pulling you out of there in a bag, you know. And same as it is with doctrine. And, uh, you know, when things come along and you say, well, I can't explain this. Well, I would, I'm settling for the word of God. I believe God's word is true. We had a long discussion about this at Bible Institute the other night um, over at Lehigh Valley. We were talking about, um, it's called presuppositional apologetics, okay? It's a big word that means only simply this, that when you look in the word of God, you start with some basic truth, Okay? When I, when I open up my Bible, I start with some basic truth. I believe God's word is true. That's a really simple statement. But what that means is if anything comes along and challenges the truth of God's word, the first thing I'm going to do is side with the word of God, and they're going to take that, and then I'm going to start saying, okay, this is what they're saying. This is what God's word is saying. I'm going to believe God's word. Now let's see how we can take God's word and and show that there's error here. I don't do it the other way. And, and so this is, um, this is one of those things that a lot of folks have an issue with. They, they get distracted, they leave the path, they swerve simply because they lack a confidence in, in God's word. And, and so when you, when you, and again, this is the kind of stuff that gets my mind going. Why does somebody not have confidence in God's word? And, um, you know, um, I, I got to say, I, 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 some of the fault has to be placed on preachers. And, and you know, there, and there's, you've heard me up at the pulpit many times letting you know when I'm talking about my opinion about things. I've got opinions, okay? And my opinion may not, may not always jive with the scriptures, okay? And I'm just saying that. This is sometimes, I'll, I'll tell you, this is the way I think about this, is how, I, you know, this is, you know, my conclusion about this. Not everybody agrees with this, and I know that. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm not na- I am not so naive to think that I got it all nailed down, okay? I don't. Um, and I'll let you know that. Um, but, you know, there are some folks out there that, that, you know, get up in the pulpit and they'll preach some things and they just, they don't have it nailed down. And they, they talk about things as if, it's, as if it's the word of God and it's not. And they make conclusions about and make doctrinal statements that are not really doctrine. And they say things that are opinions. Uh, you know, we've been talking on Sunday, uh, on our preaching service on Sunday, we've been talking about types in the Bible and things like that. I've been really upfront with this. And I, I know it may not be like a big deal to you, but it's a really big deal to me. Uh, when I say something's a type, I'm going to say it's a type because by, the Bible is going to back that up. But there's a lot of things in the Bible that are not types. And I won't use the word type. We're going to talk about the, pa- we're going to start talking about the Passover today. I've got a lot of stuff I'm going to say about it. Uh, Jesus, you know, Christ, who is our Passover. We're going to talk about that this morning. That's a type. It's a really clear statement in, in the New Testament concerning an Old Testament truth. That's a type. We talk about Christ, talk about the Lamb. Um, beautiful type. Not everything's a type in the Bible, okay? But, you know, folks will get up and say, well, this means this because and it's their opinion. Okay, now, I, I find this problematic because when a person has that mindset, of saying that something is something or something means something or something represents something and they say it dogmatically and yet it's not scriptural, then all of a sudden what you're doing is you're taking people's confidence away from the authority of scripture and placing it on an individual. And that's a problem. Because where does confidence need to lie? It needs to lie in the word of God and on God himself and not on man. I am not the sole authority. I never will be. Only God is. So we have to take what he says and how he defines things and what he says they are. A couple, uh, a couple years ago, I was at a, um, a conference 
It's not like a hermeneutics type conference. Oh, they're fun, hermeneutic conferences, you know. And um, actually, it was really good, a uh, good, uh, good speaker that week. Um, and um, he, he spoke about some things which were, which were phenomenal. I really enjoyed it. And he talked about these very truths ab- about, um, about misrepresenting things in the Word of God. Um, and, you know, if he, uh, I use that word hermeneutics a lot. I hope it doesn't scare you. But all that means is your method of interpretation of the Bible, okay? Now, how, how, do, you, how do you interpret the Bible? It's her, that's your hermeneutic, okay? And, and so... Um, you know, when I, when, I op- when I open my Bible, you know I'm, I, love, I love the language. I, I have a, I'm really passionate about the language. So I look words up all the time. I build a lot of sermons around words and definitions, phrases, things like that, because it's the word of God. Um, there's, there's history involved. There, there's, you know, the historical context that it's in. There's, there's you know, different things. Is, is, it, is it psalm? Is it poetry? Is it, a pro, is it a parable? That, oh, my. I tell you, folks have messed up a lot of doctrine because they extract things out of parables and they build doctrines on things that were never intended to be doctrine because they have a bad hermeneutic about what a, what a parable is. And so there's a lot of things that go into it. And, um, you know, every time I sit down with my Bible, you know, it's not like I have a, I, actually, I used to have a chart, you know, you know, this, I got to bring this and this and this. But now you just, you just think about, okay, what, where, where am I? It's like you're sitting in your Bible and you're thinking, all right, now this means this and this is coming from that. And it's in this and this, 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 this book of the Bible. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I, um, I'm, um, I'm a dispensationalist. So I'm thinking about, you know, if I'm in the Old Testament, what dispensation I'm in and what, you know, what have they, what truths they have been exposed to and what, you know, what, how are they operating in this dispensation, pulling these things in. I'm looking at, you know, tenses and all that fun stuff. And, you know, so before I open my mouth and say, this is what God says, I better be sure that that's what God said. Because I'm going to stand before God and give an account to that someday. There's a lot of folks that just don't do that. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying I'm better. I'm just saying there's a lot of folks that just don't do that. They'll open up their Bible. They'll find a nice little verse to preach from, and they'll build a message and build doctrine and build things based on a verse of Scripture they're going to find somewhere, and it's going to sound nice, but it may not be correct because they've just pulled something right out of context and done whatever they wanted to with it. That is wrong. And what happens is that folks folks build a lack of confidence in good, solid doctrine because the doctrine they're hearing is not good and solid. It's dangling out there on a string. And, you know, if something's dangling out there, it's easy to swerve from it. It's just blowing in the wind. And there's a problem with that. I was, um, I had pulled out, um, these, are, these are the notes I had from that, um, that hermeneutics conference, and I was thinking about that a couple weeks ago, and I pulled these out and stuck it in my notebook, it's been in there about three or four weeks, I think, and he had a couple of really interesting examples about some things, and um, like for instance, go, go, take your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, we're just going to talk about a few things. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna build a nice we're gonna build a sermon today. Let's build a sermon. All right, Mark chapter four. Um, Lord Jesus Christ is with his uh, apostles. Verse number thirty-five. In the same day, uh, when the evening was come, he saith unto them, uh, "Let us pass over unto the other side." And when they sent away the multitude, they took him. Um, uh, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with them other little ships, and there arose a great storm of the air, um, excuse me, there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that uh, it was now full, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? 
no, uh, how is it that you have uh, no faith? And um, I mean, it's a great passage of Scripture. I've heard a lot of good preaching out of this. And um, let, me, let me just make a statement. If I, this is a great term, sermon title. The Lord will calm every storm. That's a great sermon title. I could preach that, you know. Because you see the example here, the Lord calming the storm. And we could talk about the storms of of the life that you're going through, and the Lord Jesus will calm every storm. You might have heard a sermon like that. I'm probably sure I have. Let Let me ask you a question. Is there anywhere in this passage of Scripture or any other passage of Scripture where it says that the Lord will calm every storm in your life? Not directly. I don't think it exists anywhere in the Bible. There, there, I mean, I've heard it before. It's not there. It will, it's not there. There is no promise that the Lord is going to calm every storm. It's just not there. Now, it's, it's nice to stand up in a pulpit and say, listen, if, you got, if you're going through some struggles in your life, the Lord's going to calm every storm. That's, it's, it's nice. That's encouraging. It's good to hear I could say it with a big old smile on my face and, and say it really reassuringly. Um, but there's no guarantee of that. There's some storms that we go through are rough. The Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's asking the Lord to take this cup away from him. He said, but not my will, but thine be done. And he went through a storm. Matter of fact, he paid with his own, his own death. I'm reminded, of course, of another storm just in the Bible. Is it Acts chapter 27? Go with me to Acts chapter 27. Paul the Apostle, he's uh, being shipped over to Italy uh, to go to Rome to face, um, to face uh, the trial, of course. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's asked uh, to, to be sent before Caesar. If you want to, you know, <laughs> off to Caesar you will go, you know. And so they send him out there. He's in a ship. He's going across the Mediterranean Sea. And, uh, and what happens? He gets, he gets stuck there in that storm. Eurachlodon, or Eurachlodon. I like Eurachlodon better because it sounds more tempestuous, okay? And, uh, and so here the storm is raging. Um, you know, granted, the Lord appears to him and says, you know, be of good courage, you know. Um, you know, you're not going to die. You're going to lose a ship, but you're not going to die. And he gives him the great encouragement there. But does the Lord calm the storm? It rages and rages and rages as a matter of fact, it gets so bad, they're out, they're out by the island of Malta. And, uh, and Christian Joy, you were there. You went to the museum. What do they have in the museum? Okay, exactly right. And how many anchors were there? Is, is that, what verse is that? You know, is, um, uh, let, me, let me get it. You've got to read the verse. It's Acts, uh, it was Acts 27, right? Look at verse number... Uh, you guys are so patient with me. I should, I should mark pages instead of just flipping. 29. Christian Joy, do you have to, verse number 29? 27, 29. All right. So the four anchors. All right. I don't know if you, any of you have heard sermons on the four anchors. I know that I have. The four anchors of the Christian life makes for great preaching, but there is absolutely nothing in the Bible. What you're doing is you're spiritualizing a physical event, and you're extrapolating your own thoughts of what the four anchors of the Christian life are. I could come up with anything, and so that sermon would be based on whose authority? I could come up with anything. I'll give you four anythings, and they could all be good, but there's nothing in that text of Scripture that says that these are anything except for four anchors that were thrown off the back of a boat. Now, I will say I've heard some good preaching about Paul and the confidence that he had in facing that because there were some great things that took place. He's, he stood up on that deck one time, and he said, he said I believe God. He had a confidence and so he could face that storm with a confidence of knowing that God was in control. That ship was going down. 
The storm was not going to be suppressed. It was going to be horrible. I have never been in a shipwreck. I mean, I've been on a, I've been on a canoe that's tipped over. Oh, wow, what a great distress that is, you know. But, um, you know, I've never been in a situation like that. But did God get him through it? Because he had a confidence in God. All right, I'm just saying, I've heard preaching about these are the four anchors of Christian life. But that, that's, man's, that's, that's man-made. That's not Bible. It makes for a great sermon, but it's not Bible. And so we, we have this tendency. Many preachers have a tendency of wanting to build a sermon. They find a text, and they present it as if it's truth. Folks are sitting in pews, and they're thinking, oh, these are the four anchors of the Christian life. And they're jotting down, because you have blank pages in the back of your Bible too, right? And you're jotting down in the back of your Bible, these are the four anchors of the Christian life. And, and all of a sudden, you've got this stuff. But it's, that is solely based on some man's opinion and not Scripture. So where's your confidence? I'm just saying, that kind of preaching and that kind of thinking Build, builds no confidence in doctrine. And so when something comes along, there's, a, there's not a hesitation to swerve because the confidence is not driven into the Word of God. It's driven into the thoughts of men. And there's no stability there. And I just want to remind you that that is so often the tendency. Oh, let me give you another one. I'm just looking through some of these notes here. All right. How many of you have ever heard a sermon about Gideon and about the fleece and about putting out the fleece? I've heard it. I probably said it once, in a, once, in, once or twice. Okay, what does that mean? What does it mean to put out the fleece? Somebody, somebody give me some good, good stuff here. What does it mean to put out the fleece? Yes, brother. You're, yeah, it's exactly right you're doing. That's what Gideon did, right? Because he's not sure, you know, what do what are we going to do here? I'm going to put the fleece out, you know, if, it, if it's wet and the ground's dry or if it's the ground's dry and it's, you know, you, you, you've read the story, okay? You're going to ring it out and stuff. Did, did, God, did God come through? Okay. All right, he did. Great story, all right? Let me ask you this. Is there anywhere in the Scripture where God tells us, commands us, or instructs us in any way, shape, or form to put out the fleece? It's just not there. Now, I know there are places in Scripture, you know, where, you know, prove me. I, I mean, I see that. I don't have a problem with that. But I think the problem lies is when you get up in the pulpit and you, you go to a text of Scripture like that and you're saying, listen, if you're going to be making big decisions in your life, then you need to put out the fleece. That's wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you should do that. And what happens is a person's confidence is, is, again, it's resting in man's opinion instead of in the word of God. Now, Gideon, he had some serious issues, okay? He, he, God did some great things with him, and it, it just, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's some of these folks in the, um, you know, you go through the book of Judges, men like Samson, men like Gideon, man, they had some issues, God did some great things with him, which is a great confidence to me because I think to myself, if God can do something with that, uh, he, he might be able to do something with me, okay? But Gideon had some serious issues with really trusting God. He was always looking for validation all throughout his life, always looking for validation. And God knew that, and God... God kind of dragged them along the way, even when he was, you know, they're sneaking into the camp and they're, here, they're overhearing this stuff, and, and, they're, and then Gideon's like, yes, hey, these guys are really afraid of us, you know? And, uh, and God gave him the opportunity of really hearing some things and, and, and building this confidence because he really lacked confidence, okay? And I just want to remind you that, you know, when you see texts like that, um, that's not doctrine, there's no doctrine of fleece laying, okay? But yet some folks will preach it that way. And so we have to be reminded. Okay, here's another good example. Um, early church, they, um, 
they, that's exactly what I was going through. They're casting lots to pick the next apostle, okay? All right, is that, is that, a, is that what we do? All right, Dennis, next church meeting, man, you bring the dice, brother, all right? We're, we're going to cast some lots, man. Um, the, uh, there, there's just so many things. We see examples, but there's no commandment. You do not build doctrine on example. Now, a good, and I've heard this. This is a really good way. When I, when I, for instance, you read in the gospel, you see the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says this. Then we see it practiced in the book of Acts. And then we see it explained in the epistles. It doesn't get much better than that, Okay. But you don't just take an example of something in the, in the scriptures and then build a doctrine out of it, you know? That's just not what we do, but yet that is what happens so often. And, and, and pulpits are filled with that. Preaching is filled with that. Brother, da uh, Brother David? Example of uh, the king who dug up the bones and had them burned. We talked about cremation. Yeah. We see that. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I. You know, what I what I look at. You know, in, in reference to cremation, I've had this. Yeah, I, I've had discussions with folks about cremation. The Bible gives no commandment. There is zero commandment in the scriptures about how someone's uh, remains would be treated. It's not there. What we have are examples, of course, of burial, and um, but we also have to realize that many believers have been burned, and, it's, it's, um, and certainly a lot of that is because of judgment, but you don't, again, that's a pattern, but it's not a commandment. Just because you see it in the scripture doesn't mean that, that anytime you burn somebody's body, you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're expressing judgment. That's, that's not in this, it doesn't say that. The Bible flat out does not say that. And, um, you know, so often uh, in reference to burial, you know, as Christians particularly, we believe in a resurrection, and we, we look for the resurrection of the dead. Do you have to have a burial or have a resurrection? No. As a matter of fact, you know, we're all going to turn back to dust anyway, except here in New Jersey, of course, we have, to, we have our, you know, concrete line coffin things going on, and, and uh, you can, for extra money, you can have them sealed before they put the top on, when I was, all right, my father-in-law, we were burying, you know, uh, his, his second wife here, she's buried here in New Jersey, and so I was with him during the whole process, and we were talking about all this stuff, and he were, they were talking, and, and I forget how much, a couple hundred bucks or whatever, to have that seal put on, and he looked at him, he says, he said, for less than 10 bucks, I can get a thing of caulk. That's what he said, and I'm thinking, good job, Al, you know, and uh, he said, no, forget about it, you know. And can you, he's right. Um, so, man, I'm getting off track now. Um, our, our bodies return to dust anyway. I am not concerned at all about the condition of my body after I die. My wife has joked for, for uh, <laughs> several years now that after I die, she's going to have me cremated and formed into a sandcastle and put me on a mantle, okay? She has said that for a long time. So... If you're around, if you're sitting on the, yeah, anyway, better, better a sandcastle than like a, uh, like a fire hydrant or something. Anyway, um, the, um, the reality of it is, is after I die, my, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. And when the, when the resurrection takes place, it doesn't matter, okay, where my body's at. God's going to put it back together. I have extreme confidence in that. But when it comes to judgment, okay, we do see things like that. Matter of fact, we see in, you know, going throughout church history about exhuming bodies and burning them to disgrace them and throwing the ashes in rivers and things like that. And, uh, but again, I, I cannot base things on example and I cannot base things on historic, okay, or practice. I have to look what, what does the Bible say? It doesn't say. And so we do see burial, but we also see many believers being burned. We see bodies being desecrated. We see, you know, folks like John the Baptist. You know, I joke around like a lot about that. You know, when we see John the Baptist when we get to heaven, he's going to be the guy walking around like this. 
okay? All right, there's a head right there, all right? Um, so you don't think that's good, David? That's good, that's good doctrine right there, brother. No, <laughs> you'll know who he is. Hey, you're John, aren't you? Yep. Um, so it doesn't, there's nowhere in the scriptures where it says that. Man, do you see what time it is? <sighs> okay, we may be finished this. I'm not sure. We'll see next week. What do you think, Dina? All right. She's not going to say one more week, is she? All right. We, it is past 3 o'clock. I'm sorry. All right, we got to end. And Lord bless you. Thanks for being in Sunday school today. All right. Okay.
Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. If you would go ahead and find yourself a seat, we're going to get started singing today. If you're gathering in the sanctuary, we're going to start singing on page 192, 192, ring the bells of heaven. And boy, there's a lot of fellowship going on out here. But we're going to come together and sing this together. 192. Ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today for us all returning from the wild. Sing the Father, meet him out upon the way, welcoming his weary, wandering child. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud harps ring. Tis a ransom for reflect the mighty sea. When to for the anthem of the free. All righty, I have a challenge for you. Just a minute ago, we had so much fellowship going on that I heard everybody. I'd like to hear you all singing nice and loud as we sing this next verse. On verse number two, page 192, ring the bells of heaven. Here we go. Ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today. For the wanderer now is reconciled. Yes, the soul is rescued from his sinful way. And is born a new and ransomed child. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud hearts ring. Tis a ransomed army like the mighty sea. Feeling forth the anthem. 
them all the free. That was great. Let's do it again. Number three. Ring the bells of heaven. Spread the peace today. Angels swell the great triumphant strain. Tell the joyful tidings very far away. For the precious soul is born again. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud harps ring. Tis a ransom army like the mighty sea. Healing forth the anthem of the free. Great job. Good to see you this afternoon. Welcome to the services today. It is sure a blessing to be in the Lord's house. I want to thank you for coming out today. We'll have a word of prayer. Got a couple announcements and uh, oh, looking forward to spending some time in the, in the word of God uh, this afternoon with you. So Brother uh, Francis, if you would, sir, would you please open our service in prayer? anybody here that does not know you, uh, take today to be the day that you reveal yourself to them, to show them the need for, for their own salvation and, and the great gift that you've given through your sacrifice for us. Lord, be with the, the teachers downstairs as, as they teach the, the young ones, and be with each and every one of us up here that we would be able to glean from your word what you would have for us. Lord, just... Uh, let us enjoy the time that we have here today, and we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Please be seated. A couple of uh, things I want to mention. First of all, a congratulations extended to Tom and Deanna. If you have not heard yet, of course, the baby was born this past Tuesday at uh, about 3.04 in the morning, and uh, there's a picture posted outside the office door there of uh, little Grayson Thomas Shorter. And uh, we are just excited. Of course, that's uh, number 14 grandbaby for us. And that's, uh, so we're, we got an even. Uh, we, we were talking about this uh, a couple months ago, and I think I was talking to one of my other grandkids. I said, man, we'll be having this even number. And then we found out that number 15 was coming. And I said, that's good, because you know, we'll have an odd number again. And to which my granddaughter said, you know, grand, you know, pup up, we've always been a little odd in our family. And she's exactly right. But uh, we are excited about the birth of grandbaby number four. And congratulations, of course, to Dennis and Donna Street on, I don't know what grandbaby you're up to, you guys. This is number nine for you guys. Okay, so you're odd, which is true. And um, <laughs> congratulations. To, amen. So I know Tom and Deanna are home uh, with the kids watching uh, via live stream. And I hope little Grayson's probably screaming his little lungs out right now. So Amen. Um, and so we're excited for that. In reference to that, um, we're going to be taking some meals over uh, for them, as we often customly do when a baby is born. So you'll see this sheet in the back there. Please, uh, there are some instructions on there, so please, uh, if you're going to sign up for meals coming up over the next couple weeks uh, for Tom and Deanna and the kids, please make sure you read the instructions and, uh, and make sure whatever applies there. Okay, so there are addresses down the bottom there and phone numbers and such. And uh, we are very excited. So for our little Grayston, uh, he is, he's doing really well. And I got a chance to see him a little bit the other day. I've had a little bit of a head cold, and so I had to keep my distance from him. But he smiled at me anyway. He's adorable. All right. Um, other announcements. Uh, with the project downstairs is going, uh, going well. We got some stuff done this past week. And uh, we, we need some, uh, some hands on Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock here at the church. Uh, primarily moving stuff. We've got some materials that are in the shed that we need to get inside the building and some other things that are in there that need to go to the scrap yard. And so I'm going to have my pickup truck here. We'll throw some stuff in the back. But um, if you can help out on Tuesday, we do need some, uh, some laborers for Tuesday night. That's at 6 o'clock here at the church. So please come on out and give us a hand. I do want to remind you next week, of course, is Mother's Day, and we'll be celebrating that as a church um, other than that, uh, I do want to remind you of some prayer requests, and um, some, uh, we mentioned some missionaries already, and of course, the, uh, Nat and Ann Williams and their family have made it safely to Thailand. They have to quarantine while they're there, and the quarantine is, is uh, progressing very well. They'll be hopefully getting out of that 
quarantine area soon and be able to get up to Chiang Mai where they'll be serving at. So do pray for the Williamses. I was talking to Brother Kevin Wood uh, yesterday, and uh, of course they're back from uh, they're back from uh, the funeral and such. Uh, they're in Scranton, uh, and um, they uh, he's been back and forth a few times. But do pray for the family and pray for comfort and during this uh, very difficult time for them with uh, Brother Wood's mom passing away. Um, other than that, uh, please do continue to remember our missionary. I read that report. I, I don't have it with me right now from over in England, and uh, that. Um, of course, Dylan uh, Brinkley with the kidney transplant, he is doing really well. The donor, Brother Kent Gossmeyer, missionary friend of ours down there in Carlisle, or in, uh, in Cornwall, England, he, is just, he just got home from the hospital. He's recovering very well. And I know both of those families would greatly appreciate your prayers, all right? I have one more announcement that I'm going to give, but we'll do that after our Bible verse. And so, uh, Brother Stephen, come on up here. First service of the month, and we have a new Bible verse he introduced this past Thursday night. So, Brother Stephen, if you would, please. Okay, good afternoon. If you all turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 20. Matthew chapter 20, looking down at verse number 27. First service of our new verse for the month of May. It's Matthew chapter 20. Oh, those are some more. Yes, it is. I was looking for that. I'm going to need that in a few minutes. So thank you. Matthew chapter 20. And looking down at verse number 27. If you're there, you could read that nice and loud with me. It says, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. If I know, we just introduced it Thursday night, but if there's anybody that's been working that and wants to give that a shot right out of the gate, you are more than welcome to. Anybody? Okay, yes, we need to work on it a little more. Sounds good. Pastor? All righty. Um, the month of May has always been a very uh, particular eventful uh, month for my dear wife and I in our, in our spiritual walk in Christ. And you're coming up this uh, um, a week from now, May the 8th, we'll be celebrating our 40, 41st anniversary of our salvation. We were saved at the church there in Claymont, Delaware, uh, 41 years ago. Back in May of 1988, uh, my dear wife and I uh, flew out to Springfield, Missouri, uh, bought a house, and started making plans for our little family of six to uh, move 1,100 miles so that we could uh, begin our training at a Bible college out there. Um, that started an extremely interesting chapter in our lives. Um, then in May of 1996, 25 years ago, I preached in a little storefront church meeting in Pemberton Borough to five military families. Uh, that evening, um, I preached at the con to the congregation at Lehigh Valley Baptist Church over in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, and then we returned back to Missouri. Uh, that following Thursday evening, May the 16th, 1996, um, I received a phone call from Pastor Doug Hammett, who informed me that he had just met with uh, three of those five families. That's the three families that actually joined Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. Uh, and they had voted to extend a call to me to be the pastor of this new mission work here in New Jersey. And, of course, I accepted that invitation immediately. And so uh, two Sundays from now, that's uh, Sunday, May the 16th, we'll be celebrating this milestone uh, for our church. Um, we're going to start the day with uh, dinner on the grounds, and uh, it'll be at 1 o'clock in the afternoon uh, here at the church, uh, followed by some outdoor preaching, and then, of course, followed by dessert. You've got to have any excuse, you know, to eat cake. Um, so please, um, plan to spend the day here. That's uh, two Sundays from now. That's May the 16th as we celebrate uh, this 25 years uh, in the ministry here. Um, you know, 25 years seems to have, uh, for me, just seems like yesterday. And I am greatly looking forward to seeing what the Lord's going to be doing uh, with his church uh, in the future. And so I hope that you'll join us all here at New Testament Baptist Church to celebrate uh, this tremendous milestone. Brother, let's have another song. Boys and girls, I'm going to put the change bucket out here for you. And if you have some change for the missions change bucket, 
you can bring that up during this next song. Brother? This church family and our pastor brings joy, and we get to sing about that right now, page 198, Joy Unspeakable and Full of Glory. If you would stand with me on page 198, start there in the first verse. seated and at this time we have a special. Jesus, oh, for grace to 
boys and girls, if you're in junior church, you are welcome to head on downstairs. Enjoy. Please uh, join me today uh, in your Bibles. Uh, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That's where we're going to start at, and then we're going to be heading back to Exodus chapter 12. We'll be looking at one of the beautiful types in the Bible. It's a really wonderful day today. I want to um, thank everyone for coming out. We do have some guests with us, and thank you for coming out for our services. We're, it's a very special day. Um, we're going to be having a baptism service at the end of uh, the preaching service um, this, this afternoon. I'm very much looking forward to that. So, I, um, uh, so I, I preempt my message by saying I'm probably not going to preach as long as I normally do, okay? I, I guess I shouldn't have said that. I always, yeah, anyway. But um, uh, I, I always enjoy uh, baptism services, and I, and I hope uh, you all stick around for that. It'll be immediately after the preaching today, so... Uh, Looking forward to that very much. Um, I ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 because we, we, we've been talking about types and pictures and, um, and illustrations throughout the scriptures of uh, you know, Old Testament truths found in the New Testament. And a type, of course, is something that we see in the Old Testament, which is defined for us in the New Testament in a, in a very real and tangible way. And often it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you would, let's stand as I read just a couple verses uh, this afternoon, verse number 7 and 8. Um, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and they have some, some issues going on at that church, and he makes a particular statement to them about purging uh, out the old leaven. You'll see that at the beginning of that verse, and this is because of some, um, some moral issues and some sin issues in the church, and it needs to, be, needs to be dealt with, and that's something we can preach about some other time, but I want to I want to center around the type that's mentioned here. So if you're with me there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 7, it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye, ha as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sanctified for us. Uh, I beg your pardon. Is sacrificed for us. I do beg your pardon. Um, therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And again, there in verse number six towards, or excuse me, verse number seven towards the end of that verse, it, we're going to be speaking about this this, uh, this afternoon. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord. It's a great joy to be able to get together in your house, and I'm so thankful, Lord, for your precious word and, and how it points us to some wonderful truths. And even this, this day as we speak about this great truth of Jesus Christ being our Passover. And Father, I pray that as we spend this time looking at your word, that you would open up the truth of the word of God, open up our hearts to it, that we would greatly appreciate what Christ has done for us, the sacrifice which is made for us. And I pray, Lord, that we would, even as your people, to, um, to live a life um, that is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service. And I pray, Father, that uh, your truth would minister to all those that are here present today, whatever the spiritual needs are, and that you would, you would help, and you would open up eyes, and that you would illuminate, and that you would do great and wondrous things, and we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, you can see it very clearly, a statement that's made about Jesus being our Passover, and of course, that's making reference back to the Old Testament, and as I mentioned, we're going to be going back to Exodus chapter 12, and so I do want to invite you to go all the way back there for me, we just use this verse as an introduction to it because that is what defines the type, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Passover. And so, um, of course, the Passover is something that the Jews still celebrate today. As a matter of fact, um, you can go to any grocery store during Passover season and you see the have a nice little aisle set apart for all the Passover stuff. Um, and does anybody else, does anybody else here like gefilte fish? Any gefilte fish fans? There is one. Thank you very much. 
If you've never had gefilte fish, you just, you know, you, it's one of those things you just got to try. You, you know, okay, anyway, horse, you put horseradish with it, it's delicious, all right? And I got to thank Brother Jeff Rubin for introducing me to the gefilte fish many years ago. Um, and, and, of course, you get that during Passover season. There's so many other great and wonderful foods that you can buy during that period of time. But uh, Passover is still something that Jews celebrate today. And, and so it's a, it's a feast day that's defined in the scriptures. You, it, it, its origin is here in Exodus chapter 12. Um, you know, uh, context-wise, the big picture-wise, uh, the children of Israel have, uh, of course, went down into Egypt um, and uh, they were led down there to save them from the famine that was coming. And they spent uh, um, um, hundreds of years down in Egypt. And at the end of that period of time, of course, they went from just a people that were being protected from the famine uh, to slaves. And they were enslaved by Pharaoh down in Egypt and uh, cried out to God for deliverance. And, of course, God sent a deliverer, and that would be Moses. That's another beautiful picture uh, that we see in the scriptures of a deliverer that sent, a, uh, and of course the Lord Jesus Christ is our deliverer. We'll be speaking about that a little bit today also. Um, but um, the, the end of this enslavement period is marked by this event, and that's the Passover. And of course it's portrayed um, in, in a lot of popular ways, of course, many years ago, that uh, Ten Commandments movie, Cecil B. DeMille's type of thing, and the, you see the angel... Uh, the, uh, the, that mist going through the land and, the, uh, and all the firstborn dying. And so really well illustrated in that sense, the all to it. But the reality of it is, is, that, is that God uh, performed this last of the plagues uh, in order to solidify the release of his people from bondage to bring them out of Egypt and then bring them eventually to the promised land. It was a, it was a deliverance. Uh, but for that to take place... Uh, there was going to be this event. It's called the Passover. Um, well defined in the fact that God was going to send death uh, through the land of Egypt. Every firstborn, whether it be of man or whether it be of, of animals, uh, are going to die. With the exception of those that were in the household where a lamb was taken and the blood was shed and the, uh, taken and struck on the doorpost. I'm going to be speaking about that a little bit more uh, in, the, in the next message on this. Um, but the, I, but the, the understanding of it is, is that God passed over them, spared them from death um, because of their obedience to his commandment and because of the application of the blood. So it's a, a beautiful picture we see in the Old Testament of God's deliverance. And we got this connection. I ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 12. I'm going, to, I'm going to read down through several verses. So I'm going to start in verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year for you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house. Uh, of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without spot. A male of the first year, um, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Ye shall keep it up unto the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the house wherein they shall eat it. And we see this commandment that's been extended to the nation of Israel. Now, this is not a one-time event. They are going to be celebrating a Passover year after year after year to commemorate this event here. So um, this is not something that is just a one and done type of thing. They are constantly reminded all throughout their history of the deliverance that God had brought to them to come out of the land of Egypt. And of course, 
here we see, as we read in the New Testament, that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover to remind us of the fact that what God did in the Old Testament, what God did to secure the deliverance of the nation of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ did to deliver us. It is a picture of Christ's work of redemption in the lives of us, his children. I want to remind you also that Passover is more than just a feast. When it says Christ is our Passover, I want to read a passage. If you'd like to turn there, that's fine. It's just a couple verses here. It's in the Gospel of Luke. It's in chapter 22. And um, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is, um, of course, preparing for his up and coming death. And he says these things. Then came, this is uh, verse number 7, Luke 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread. That's that Passover celebration period of time. It's the whole period of time. The day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. So we see in the word of God that the word Passover is more than just the name of a feast or a festival. It has to do with the lamb itself. It has to do with the sacrifice itself. The Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare for, uh, excuse me, go and prepare f- um, uh, us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he, of course, gives him instructions from there. But I, I just wanted to make a point of the fact and, and understand when we look in the scripture and the Bible talks about Passover, it's more than just a party. It's more than just a feast. It's more than just sitting around and even as they do today, uh, having the herbs and things like that. It's more than just sitting around a table and celebrating uh, something. The Passover centered around the sacrifice. It's centered around the lamb that was taken. It's centered around the death of that lamb. That's what the Passover actually was all about. Please notice back in our text there in the book of Exodus as we read that uh, lengthy portion there, verses 1 through 6, we read that. And I, I do want to make a point of a few things in reference to this Passover. Verse number 3, again in that text in Exodus chapter 12 says, Spake ye unto the congregation of Israel, say, saying, In the tenth day of the month thou shalt take of them every man a lamb. And so the lamb was the, was the central, the integral part of the Passover celebration. But it wasn't just any lamb. If you'll notice down in verse number 5, it says very specifically that the lamb shall be without blemish. This is a very important part of the celebration. I don't know how um, um, you are with animals, but, you know, I, I don't, you know when, I, when I pick up an animal, I don't sit there and look at it and look for blemish. I just don't do that. You know, we've got a couple grand dogs, and they're just maniacs anyway. And, um, you know, we, we have... Now, grand chickens and grand ducks, and and we have a grand rabbit too, don't we? Oh my, it's a zoo. Uh, um, And I don't, I don't sit there and pick up the animals and look through them and say, any any blemishes on this critter? I mean, I don't really think about that. I don't really actually even care about that very much. And um, uh, but they had to care about it. It was a very integral, important part of the celebration. No blemishes. They had to have that examination. Now, I don't know what kind of blemishes a lamb would have. I mean, if it was born and ran through a briar bush and had scars and scratches and scrapes and things like that, and that would take it off the list. If it had, you know, like, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, like um, Brother Dennis had a dog one time. I really miss your dog, Hershey. He was the best dog ever. And uh, he was just a mess. He, had, he ran through the woods one time and knocked his eye out. Is like one, I think they called him lucky, I'm not sure. But anyway, but Hershey was a mess. And he was he without blemish? Not even close, man. That dog. Yeah, I did. that dog is a mess. So, I mean, if it was Passover season, man, he'd be off the list real quick. And um, so there had to be this, this examination of this animal. It had to be without blemish. And I think it's very important, it's very important that we get the picture here. When the Lord Jesus Christ is declared to be our Passover, it's because he qualified for it. In order to qualify to be our Passover, he had to be without blemish. And we're not talking about externally with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about in the soul. He was without sin. This is a main qualifier of the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Passover. This is not just a matter of fact that he looked good or had uh, good 
good complexion. It had to do with his redemptive value of being sinless. He was without sin. A great portion of Scripture is found over in 1 Peter chapter 1. I do want to direct your attention there um, in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm just going to read a couple verses, verse number 18 and 19, which speaks about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 18, for as much as you know that you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Now, that word redeemed means to be purchased or purchased out of something, redemption. That means that we are, you think about our position uh, without Christ, that we're destined for damnation, that we are, we're, in the, we're in the family of the devil. Please do realize that every one of us that are born in this world, we are born into the family of the devil. It's the reality of it. We're not born into the family of God. We have to be reborn into the family of God. And so we, are, we, are, we find ourselves in a very bad position, and we need to be taken out of that. You can't buy it with silver and gold. That's, they, they're referred to as corruptible things. It's amazing. People work their entire lives to gather together things like silver and gold. And the Bible refers to those things as corruptible. But we're not redeemed with corruptible things as in silver and gold from our vain conversation received by the tradition of, our fa- of, of your fathers. That's a very interesting statement. That uh, vain, conversa- uh, vain conversation is talking about a manner of life or lifestyle. In other words, um, the, um, the tradition is, you can think about that in so many different ways. Tradition, religion, you could talk about uh, mo- you know, traditional moral values, things like that. I'm not saying it's wrong to have moral values, but I will say this, moral values do not redeem you. Religion does not redeem you. What we learn as far as you know, the traditions of men will not redeem you. The only thing that redeems you is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we have, um, uh, we have been redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold from the vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Here he is again. We're going back. He's taking the Lord Jesus Christ. He's making the picture. He's taking us back to the Old Testament. He's showing us this lamb that was uh, at the Passover, this first Passover celebration. He's talking about the blemishness of that lamb and speaking about the blood of Jesus Christ. It is without spot. It makes it, it, it gives it the suitable value in order to redeem. There is nothing else that is suitable to redeem us from, uh, from where we're at in, in, in our lives. You know, I, I've, uh, I've traveled um, to other countries. I always enjoy uh, picking up foreign currencies. You know, in our ministry here, I've had a lot of military families, and uh, a lot of guys will go on TDY, temporary duty assignment, or they'll, you know, be, you know, be stationed somewhere for a while. And I always, I always joke around when guys go on TDY, I always say, you know, li- listen, don't forget your pastor. Either bring back coffee or currency, okay? And so I've had coffee from around the world, which has been spectacular, uh, but also currency. So if, you know, if they, like, if they aren't like TDY, like San Diego or something, you can bring back some currency, all right? But anyway, um, you'll get that some. Um, the, um, they, they brought back, I've got, I got a stack of currency in my office like this, all right? And um, um, Troy, have you ever, do you collect ter- currency when you're like all overseas? And, and why would we put it in a drawer? How much value does it have? It's zero. I mean, I've got bills in there. I've got, I, I mean, in, in, in uh, let me see, yeah, in Zimbabwe, I'm a billionaire in Zimbabwe. I really am, okay? I couldn't buy a loaf of bread, but I'm a billionaire in Zimbabwe, all right? Um, I've got, cur- when, when Brother uh, Rich Putnam was here, he spent a lot of time in Central Africa. I've got, you know, Rwanda and Congo and all this stuff. And the only, the only bills I've got that have any value back in there are some euros. That's the only one. Everything else is just, like, couldn't even get a cup of coffee, okay? It's that bad. Because it has no value. You can't, you really can't redeem anything with it. And I just want to say that so much of what's in religion today 
has no redemptive value. It's, I mean, you can hold, it's like, you know, this is what I got. You know, I got, the, I got this tradition. I've got, I'm holding on to this. And, you know, what's amazing is that even in our world today, you know, we've been talking about several of our missionaries, you know, like Brother Noah George over there in Lebanon right now. Oh, their economy tanked. And folks can't even afford to buy. I mean, I was ta- typing with Brother George a week or so ago. He says, you know, you can work a whole week and still not make enough money to even buy your groceries because it's so bad. So, you, I mean, you could be standing in the line at the grocery store and have a handful of bills, and it still is worthless. Now, you take that, and you stand before God, and you say, look what I've got. Lord, I've done all this, and look at all my good works. And we have, a, we have no redemptive value when we stand before God. And he'll say, depart from me. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Depart from me. I knew you not. Because what we have is worthless when we stand before God. But what does it say that is worth? What does it say that has redemptive value? It's the blood of Christ. It's the blood that Jesus Christ shed for you. That is the redemptive value. It's the lamb without blemish and without spot. That's the Passover lamb that's spoken about here in, in Exodus chapter 12. That's what uh, uh, Paul was talking about, about in 1 Corinthians, Jesus Christ, our Passover. That's what it's saying here in this portion of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1, that the Lord Jesus Christ as the lamb, as this uh, Passover, without spot, without blemish, it's his sinless perfection that makes him suitable to be our redeemer. The Passover redeemed the, 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 the Passover from the Old Testament redeemed the people unto God out of slavery. That's what took place. And, and after, the, after this tremendous uh, um, event, this Passover, it was, it was the last of the ten plagues, right? After this tremendous event, God's people were, were cast out to get these people out of here. And Pharaoh had enough of it. And it's, it's what provided for them the opportunity of leaving slavery and beginning to make that process uh, that uh, process back to the promised land. It's the Passover that redeemed God, uh, the people unto God. It's the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, that redeemed you and I out of the slavery of sin. Nothing else could do that. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, and according to his mercy, he saved us. This is, this is what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. Go with me, if you would, please. We're coming back to Exodus chapter 12, so just keep something there in that place. But Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. i got to say that I end up in this portion of Scripture so often. I love uh, this passage here in Hebrews chapter 10 especially when we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and we're talking about this work of redemption which he has done for us. Hebrews chapter 10, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. And as we've been talking about types and pictures and shadows from the Old Testament into the New Testament, this is a a great introduction into that subject matter. Of course, it's a shadow of good things to come uh, and not the very image of the thing uh, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year at year by year continually uh, make the comers thereunto perfect. And what he's making reference back to is the Old Testament sacrifices um, there that were in the tabernacle in the wilderness and then subsequently in the temple in the city of Jerusalem. The main emphasis of this portion of Scripture is actually going to be the Day of Atonement. And that is, that's another great picture that we'll talk about sometime in the, very few, in the near future in reference to Jesus Christ being, as the Bible calls in our propitiation. And we'll talk about that a lot more in detail. But, you know, that when, the, when the Scripture talks about uh, these sacrifices... We can, we can lump in with that all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. They had sacrifices for all kinds of things. It was a nonstop event in the tabernacle in the wilderness and then into the, into the temple in Jerusalem. It was it, nonstop. There were sacrifices going on all the time. And he's talking about those things. And he says, for, for them, 
would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. In other words, they kept doing those things because there was still a need for the sacrifices. The sacrifices, although they were ordained by God, never brought things to a final conclusion. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance once again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. And that's a quote from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms. Um, verse number 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure, has had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, and in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God, of, uh, above when he had, uh, had said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, to take away the first, that he may establish the second. He's making reference there to the first, that the first covenant. We call it the Old Testament. I'm not talking about the book itself. I'm talking about the, the testament that was made on Mount Sinai, the giving of the law. And the second, of course, he's talking about the blood that was shed by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, and he, and he signed, sealed, and delivered a new testament or a new covenant with mankind uh, paid for by his own blood. He's talking about this establishing the second. By the which will, that word will is talking about desire, um, the, you know, the desire of, of seeing something completed. You know, you can even think about this as in if you've ever uh, had somebody that's passed away and they've left a will or a testament, they've left something and said, this is my desire to, for whatever is to take place after my demise, after my death, this is what my desire is. Think about that when you read this verse. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I love that verse. It's a done deal. We're talking about this lamb. We're talking about this Passover. You know that when the you know the Israelites certainly they commemorate, they celebrate the Passover year to year after year after year, but it was a one-time event. God took them out of slavery and bondage in Egypt and led them out uh, with his mighty hand and brought them into the promised land. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, by one sacrifice, forever sanctified us, brought us out, set us apart unto himself. And every priest, this is verse number 11, every priest, this is talking about the Old Testament priesthood, and every priest standing, standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Well, that's a sad verse of Scripture right there. Certainly, they were, it was necessary. They did it by the command of God. But those sacrifices they made never took away sin. And yet, the same thing goes on day after day after day as mankind and their religions are sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing. It may not be animals. It may be good works. It may be rituals. It may be uh, sacraments that they do. That they are constantly doing these things, and this is what it says. Those things can never take away sin, but this man, talking about Jesus, this is talking about Jesus Christ. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. What a blessed truth that is. This is what Christ has done for us. Why, why could he do that? How, how is it possible that he could do that? It's because he was a lamb without spot or blemish. He had no sin. There was no sin found in him. He was the sinless lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. This is what Christ has done for us. Go back to our text, if you would, please, and in, uh, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, and we saw, we saw very clearly, of course, that they were to take the lamb. Again, Christ is our Passover. That's the picture, right? That's the type. 
So what is, what is it about this Passover? What is it about this, this lamb, this sacrifice that was made? Well, first of it, was, it was without blemish. Uh, it also reminds us, and I want to drop down to verse number 6, and it says, and they kept it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. In other words, it is identified as being spotless, and then it's kept. It's, re, it's preserved or reserved until a very specific purpose and the purpose, of course, was to die. But it's kept. It's kept for a purpose. And I just want to remind you about some of this purpose for us. First of all, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was kept for the purpose of our redemption. Now, I've already mentioned that, that we're not redeemed with gold and silver, these corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Jesus I want to read, if, if you would, please go with me to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, chapter, um, I'm going to read it in several places in Galatians, so just go with me there, please. Galatians chapter 1, and uh, here uh, again, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ here in the, in the book of Galatians, and I will read it as soon as I get to it. There we go, in Galatians chapter 1, and um, look, at verse, uh, look at verse number 3. It's part of uh, Paul's salutation to those churches there in Galatia. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, speaking of Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, by whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, we're talking about this work of deliverance. And, of course, the purpose of the lamb and that Passover celebration there in, in Egypt was to, to, um, to redeem a people, to deliver them out of the present condition. And so Christ has been given for, uh, and, and kept for a purpose, and that is, first of all, for your redemption and, as you can see there, for your deliverance. Now, redemption, we often, and, and rightfully so, we speak about something that's eternal. And I certainly do believe that, that I am saved eternally. I have eternal life at this present time. That's not something I have to hope for for the future. I know that I have eternal life now through Jesus Christ. But this is talking about something that's a little more tangible right now that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now, I do want to say the children of Israel were in a bad state. And I do want to say that what Christ, is, what Christ has done for us is something that's, that has eternal or spiritual value to it. <clears throat> but I do want to remind you also that when Christ redeems us and gives us eternal life, that is not just some pie in the sky, one day, someday we're going to go to heaven, and I'm very thankful for that, thank you very much. But he's delivered me today. He's given me eternal life today. He has given me the strength to live in a world that is filled with wickedness and to live above it to be in this world but not of this world, I'm a, I'm, I'm a redeemed person. If you're a child of God, so are you. Wasn't it amazing how the children of Israel, as they came out of Egypt and they began to be tempted with things like, you know, starvation and, and dying of thirst in the wilderness, um, their first thought was to go back to Egypt? They've been delivered from that. We've been redeemed from that. Why would we possibly ever want to go back to that? But we see that time and time again throughout the Old Testament. They wanted to go back to it. We've been, re we've been delivered from this present evil world. And we should be, of all people, desirous to, to extract ourselves from that, to cross across the, uh, the Red Sea, to, to go into this journey that God has given us to follow along and to not cast our eyes back on Egypt. We're a redeemed people. The purpose of that lamb was to deliver us from that bondage. Why would we ever want to live that way again? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. I mean, how, sh how shall we that have been you know, delivered from that sin want to live any more in it? Why would you want to live in Egypt when you can live in the promised land? 
So he redeemed us, but he also, if, if you're here in Galatians, just turn a couple pages over to Galatians chapter 4, and we're just a couple other verses here. Verse number 3, it begins by saying this, even so we, uh, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We have a great relationship with God the Father through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a family relationship we have. But I want you to notice also that we have been redeemed from under the law. That's a big statement, being under the law, talking about under the penalty of the law. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. We have violated God's law. There's not a one of us that is sitting here, nor standing, myself included, that has not violated God's law in some way, shape, or form. We are all guilty before God. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, we all deserve condemnation because we have violated God's law. But God has provided a way for us to be taken out from underneath of that penalty, and that's Jesus Christ. The children of Israel were under the bondage of the Egyptians, and God brought them out from underneath that. We were under the penalty or the bondage or the pressure, the condemnation of the law. It's as if the sword has been drawn and the judgment is about to be executed upon us and we looked and we saw that there was hope and that hope was not found in ourselves it was found in Jesus Christ it was found in our Savior and we cried out unto him Lord save me and he reached down and he snatched us from the this condemnation which we certainly did deserve because we violated the law of God and Jesus Christ rescued us and not only did he do that but then he brought us into his family and now we cry out Abba Father in other words, God is our, is our Father. We are part of His family now. It's a great thing that this Lamb has done for us. And then also He has given us this, this great relationship to Him. We, we read this. I want to I end with this verse of Scripture. We read this last night, and we had men's prayer, and, and appreciate Brother Andrew was preaching last night, and uh, he was in this portion of Scripture, and it's just so fitting uh, for the conclusion of my message today, and uh, we were in first, and, and second, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter five. If you just go over there with me, I'm going to end with this verse, and um, look at verse number Second um, Corinthians chapter five. Look at verse the the final verse in that chapter, verse number twenty one. It says it says this: For he hath made him to be sin for us. God the Father has made his Son, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. And it says particularly of Jesus, who knew no sin. In other words, he was the spotless, blemishless Lamb of God. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is our Christian life. That Jesus Christ came, the Lamb, and he was without spot, he was without blemish, and he took our sins upon himself, and in doing so provided us the means by which we could be made right with God. He redeemed us. He delivered us. He purchased us. We are a redeemed people. I want to remind you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that Jesus Christ has become sin for us and redeemed us unto himself, that he has brought us into a relationship with the Father through him, through the Lord Jesus, and has provided for us righteousness. It's not ours, it's his. And we are right with God. We are to live as a redeemed people a people purchased by the blood of Christ, a unique people. The children of Israel, as they came out of Egypt, 
They traveled, of course, through the wilderness, and there's a lot of things we can speak about with that, some, some good and, and not, some not so good in reference to their behavior and their activities. But I just want to say that they, God preserved them as a unique people and brought them into the promised land. And God has redeemed a people unto himself, and that's you and I. And we should live a redeemed life, a life that is solely dedicated to him, crying unto him, Abba, Father. And I don't want to remind everyone that's here that what Christ has done on the cross, the shedding of his precious blood, the work of redemption which he has accomplished, is sufficient to pay for all the sins of mankind, and that's your sins. And you've, if you've never come to a place in your life where you've accepted that free gift of salvation, today can be the day. God has given his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Passover, as the sacrificial lamb to shed his blood so that you could be free. And if you'll accept that precious gift, I said the wages of sin is death, but that verse continues. And it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is your Passover. He is your sacrifice. He is your Savior. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I'm so thankful, Lord, for the beautiful picture we see here in the scriptures concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and the beautiful sacrifice which was made for the remission of the sins of all the world. And Lord, there are, um, there are so many that are holding on to the vain traditions of their fathers. There are so many that are holding on to their good works. There are so many that are um, trying to redeem themselves with something that is worthless Oh, Father, thank you for what Christ has done. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would allow the truth that we've seen in your word to be so real to, to all of us today. Father, I thank you for the salvation that you brought to so many that are here. And I pray, Lord, that we would live a redeemed life, a life that glorifies you, a life that does not look back to Egypt, a life that is always striving to move forward into the land of promise which you have given to us. And I pray, Father, that we would be a redeemed people and live in that way. I pray, Father, for any that are, have this burden in their heart concerning the forgiveness of sins, the needing of peace in their lives, and, and I, I, a settledness concerning etern, uh, their eternal life. And, Father, I just ask you, Father, please, just be merciful. And Lord, that you would work in their hearts even this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? Let's bow our heads for just a little bit. Our pianist is going to play through a little bit of this invitation. And if the uh, Lord is dealing in your heart about anything and you'd like to just come and pray, I invite you to do that. If you've got some concerns, you'd like to like to pray with someone about I'll be I'll be standing right up here I'd love to talk to you you got some concerns about some things in your in your spiritual life maybe it's about your salvation and you'd like to talk to somebody or pray with someone I just invite you just come forward nobody's going to get embarrassed just an opportunity of spending some time with the Lord in prayer whatever the need would be I invite you please to respond to God's word today
Thank you very much. Would you please be seated for just a little bit? I'm going to invite uh, Brother Manny to join me up front here. Come on up here, brother. And uh, it's been a real joy uh, for having Brother Manny uh, here in our ministry these uh, last several months, and we've uh, had some conversation. He said he desires to be a part of our ministry and, of course, uh, needs to be baptized. And what I ask is if Brother Manny would mind sharing a little bit about his testimony and uh, and then we'll be presenting them before the congregation for, uh, um, for church membership and then going right into the baptistry. And so, uh, Brother Manny, do um, you believe the Lord saved you? Yes. Amen. Amen. Would you mind sharing some things about that? All right. All right. wrongly and uh, one is a Christian who flaunts their gifts and uh, the other is a Christian who stores up, st stores up their gifts in a box and hides them and I am the Christian that hid their gifts today I, I've decided to not hide them anymore they just, my name's uh, Manny Rivera it's short for Emmanuel but I prefer Manny so because I mean it's obvious I have a I have uh, three siblings. I was born in Puerto Rico, and I'm from Corazon, which is in the center, the mountain area. Grew up Catholic, but uh, I had, uh, and I went to church in a, in Perth Amboy. And I didn't, I didn't have any, uh, I don't have any, I have good memories. I have two good memories, one of my dad and, and one of my mom. But one of my dad is, uh, every time after a Catholic church, it was very, uh, Catholic church very long, and after it, we would go to the bodega, and he would get us uh, these onion rings, right? Yeah, and uh, he didn't have he didn't have the, at that time. He, right now he's balling, but at that time he he didn't have that much money. He would always get us onion rings and malta goya. So it was that uh, I love that. And to this day, all my siblings we all love onions. Like to this day, like if you give them onions right now, they'll just take them. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, my, the other one was of my mom, because my mom would always dress us up, like, it, it would, like in suits. So like in kindergarten and first grade, me and my brother would be like, like we were businessmen. It was, it was kind of embarrassing, because everybody was dressed normal, and we were always dressed up. And when we went to church, I didn't like the shoes, because they were uncomfortable on my feet. So I asked my mom, could you, could I not, could I wear sneakers? And she said no. So I was like, all right, okay. So I went to church, and in Catholic church they have you kneel, and uh, so when when they kneel, I I I'm, I'm different from my brother, where my brother would just go in. I like to observe. So I went in, in the time of kneel, I actually went under there and, and looked at everybody's shoes. <laughs> I saw like I don't remember the exact number, but I counted men wearing sneakers. So I went to my mom at the church. I was like, Mom, there's 13 guys wearing sneakers, <laughs> you know. And, let me have a, and, and then she, still this day, she thinks that's funny, but I actually got to wear sneakers all year, <laughs> so it was great. So I, I, uh, I went to life, I went through life not really knowing who Jesus is. Um, went to the public school, I, you know, I, just, I, I didn't really enjoy that. Um, but the good thing was that I stayed back in kindergarten, you know, it's kind of weird, I know, but I didn't know um, English, so it, it held me back. And I got to go to school with my brother, so that was, it was actually pretty good. Um, and went to college, and I think when, in college is when I, I first got the gospel shared to me. And um, m my friend would invite me to a Pentecostal church. I know what the Pentecostals, but I went there, heard the, the gospel, um, and what intrigued me of it was that when you receive Jesus, that you get the Holy Spirit, and in the Holy Spirit you can have conversation with God. So for me, I was like, I, I, you know, I get to have conversation with God. That was what I, what I wanted that. But at that time, you know, I had that was the time I had my first, I, I had my first girlfriend at that time, and I had, you know, I, I was having fun. I was like, but if I go over there, yeah, if I go to God, I knew that I probably might lose all those things. So everything was going good. And then in September 28, uh, 2008, 
gave my life to the Lord, and my life just went like, it, 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 was, it was like he was thrown into the fire. Uh, different approach to sin. Um, it, and I, I, would go, I went to that church maybe for like eight, eight to a year, eight months, and it was just, it was just really weird. Uh, it, uh, the conversations there, the the sermons there. I just, I that experience like led me to go away from church because I, I didn't want to be around the church, right? I, I just, and I thought that that was what church was. So for like ten years, um, I I didn't go to church, and there was always a conviction, right? There was a conviction to go. But I would always reply to it like, well, I went to church, right? I went to church. I, did I not go to church? I tried this. And then look what happened. Right? Look, look, what, look where I am now. And it got, it, you know, God's never done. He's always going to, it, it's like a, I was always in a losing battle, right? Like it's like, uh, like whatever you uh, reap, you will sow, right? So I was doing things that I shouldn't, shouldn't have been doing, right? And I was reaping that already. I was reaping, you know, and it's not like, so I hate God, no, I deserve what I was getting. And uh, it wasn't until, like, I, I started to read, uh, I think it was James, where it says, if, if, you, if you want wisdom, ask for wisdom. And I asked God, uh, this was like 10 years later, and what were like the, I have to go back to, what are the three reasons why um, I, there was a desire to go back to church, right? So the first reason is uh, Jesus, right? And who is Jesus to me, right? And and the first reason is uh, the first reason answers the other two, right? Like if, if if not for the first one, I could not do the other two, right? So who is Jesus to me? He's a my savior, uh, my my defender, and when when uh, everyone forsakes me, uh, Jesus was there. Um, when the enemy, when the enemy came after me, Jesus defended me. So that, so uh, I'm nervous. I apologize. But uh, the the second one was the second one was the the body of Christ, right? And how it, that was explained to me, like I, I didn't. Uh, the body, the body of Christ, like. You can't, for me, like, you can't throw a punch, right, without your whole body moving together. That was how it was explained to me. And, you, like, if, if, you were miss, if, the, if you were missing a leg, you wouldn't throw that punch well, right? You just, you know, you, you might fall on the ground, right? But those two things, like Jesus and the body of Christ, um, for me, I already had Jesus, right? So why, why should I need to go to church, right? I already went there. I experienced it, it. I had a bad experience there, right? And I began to. I, I found this uh, YouTube channel. It, it was a Baptist preacher in there, and he was uh, preaching hard uh, against sin, against things that you know uh, pastors of this day don't preach about, right? So it's just like this guy is just going off. Um, and he, in there, he he had a sermon about rewards. And that was what got me to want to go to church because uh, you know this this clothes is it's gonna it's gonna probably it's gonna rot away. My car you know, is about to it's about to be gone. You know the car is, everything rusts away, but the word of God is forever. Those rewards are forever. So uh, you know I'm gonna see Jesus anyway. So I, I you know I don't know how to say that. To, like, I want those rewards. So that's why I went to it. But when I went to it, I didn't go to a Baptist church because just because I was hearing a, a from a Baptist pastor, I didn't consider myself a Baptist. I was like, I disagree with the Baptist. So I ended up going to a mega church, <laughs> like one of those mega churches, and it was a Calvinist uh, church, and they were non-denominational. So they asked me, well, "What's your story?" And I told them, "Hey, uh, listening to a Baptist preacher, I you know I don't agree with you guys." But I'm gonna come here. This is my time. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it's like my first time going to church in like 10 years. And they, you know, they allowed me in there. But that time spent at that mega church, I learned what happened to me at the at the Pentecostal church because 
to get a lot of people to show up, you're gonna have to have like a show, like a, a theater, I would call it a theater. And I was there, I, I saw it, I was serving in the, in the lights, and if, if the show's not there, people do not show up. It, it, it is what it is, and I was listening to the YouTube channel while going to the mega church, and the pastor was preaching against, against mega churches, and then I would see what, what goes on in, in the mega church. And it was, it was uh, I, I understood what happened to me at the Pentecostal one. They were preaching oneness, and I would remember when it, when when the pastor uh, explained what oneness is. I would remember the sermon of this pastor uh, talking about oneness, but it was always uh, shown in like a, it sounds nice, but it, it, it's not good, right? It, but it's it, but it, it but for the ear it, it'll sound nice, right? So I, I you know uh, I ended up I ended up. As, when I was going to the mega church, I was in Florida. So I ended up coming back here to Jersey, right? And I, when I first, I'm not originally from here. I'm, I'm from North Jersey. So um, I didn't know, like, for, when I first met the Pineys people, I just, <laughs> I just, I didn't like you guys. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's what it is. I didn't like you because... Well, you guys didn't like me either, so, so uh, and even my neighbors, like, they don't even talk to me. But I grew up, like, I, I grew up going to sleep with the, the sound of the train, so, it, so this peaceful thing, it, it, it threw me off. Like, it's too peaceful here. And, and uh, so when I come back to Jersey, I'm like, oh, man, it's blue state, I don't want to be here. Uh, and it's, it's just, it, you know, I, I was like, well, you know, I, I felt abandoned by God, you know, abandoned by God. And he, uh, and then I, I was always watching the YouTube channel. So the YouTube channel at that time, and it's a church in Arizona, by the way. So YouTube channel at the time was talking about men with long hair. And I had long hair. So, you know, I, you know, I ended up cutting my hair. And then it was, it was talking about men with long hair, sermons, and then the local church. So could God want me to go to the local church, right? So then at that time, I started going to the local churches. And uh, there was three churches, and I, I went, the first one I went to was Wrightstown. The guy told me, go to your local one. You know, I was like, I feel like this is, you know, they, they're all local, right? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. But when I came here, um, and me, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you know this, but I don't really like talking people that much, because when I decided to come back to, to church, my thing to God was, well, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'll go to church just so I don't get the, the judgment, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to do it your way. I'll go to church my way. So my way would be, I don't, I come in here, I talk to nobody, right? I sit in the back, right? And when I can't, I try to sit in the back here, but everybody kind of hogs the back here. <laughs> here, I had to sit in the front, right? Yeah, that's terrible. I had to, yeah, in the front here, and then that's that's hard because you can't run out of there. <laughs> you, you have to maneuver to try not to talk to people, right? And that's why, I, that, that, so you know, that was my strategy. I sat in the back for the thing to, to go, and then God, you know, I didn't understand, well, you, I mean, it's obvious, but why God wasn't answering me. I was asking God, I was like, why, didn't you, why aren't you answering me? You know, he, he wasn't answering me for a while in certain areas, right? And I, I didn't understand so I went here for like six months, seven months. I, you know, it just, it just it irked me. We tried not to talk to you, brother. We yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Brother. But uh, <laughs> so I went. I, I ended up going away from here. And at by that time, I was I was uh, trying to get this job to get out of here. Right? I'm trying to get out. Right? I'm trying to get the job to get out. And I ended up going to the interview. To, uh, for that job, and they didn't give it to me. So I was I was very depressed. Uh, I asked, uh, I so that YouTube church, their uh, YouTube changed their community guidelines, and they ended up uh, cutting off that that the YouTube channel. So that, so it's gone. But I, I got their email. I emailed them. You know, I was depressed. I, I you know I needed I needed guidance, and I talked to the assistant pastor of that church, and then he. And it's it's almost like it's like it's like God is connecting it all, right? And and it, I need to talk to him because he told me 
go to your local church. You know, like it's like go to your local church. And and he and and he when he first started, when he gave his life to God, he said he was going to go to the job that I wanted. And he, and he said God took him away. So how is it that I could go to talk to a guy that was going to have the same job that I wanted, right? So it was, it was like, man, I was like, all right, well, I'll go to the local church. So I went back here, and I did the same thing. I, did, I, uh, I, approached, I approached church my way, right? Um, but, but you know what? I, I began to open up to people here more. I was like, all right, fine, I'll open up. Yeah, and and, and it, it, it was good to open up here because um, that's like the, I didn't really get edified in my first church, right? And now it's like when I open up and all the men here have encouraged me some way. But one guy in particular, um, and I'm not going to say his name because I, I want God to reward this guy because he said things, he said two things to me in, in a time that I was discouraged here. And one of them being, you know, who Jesus kept around him. He kept three men, right? And those three men, uh, he said, those three men were completely different from one another. One was a you know, loving guy. He's the apostle of love, right? Another was a le the leader, and another was uh, fire and brimstone. And at that time, I needed that because I let you guess which one I am. You know, yeah. I, I don't have that many friends. So, I mean, I, and, and, I, and I think, like, uh, Brother Stephen, he has that that uh, gift for like compassion, mm -hmm. right? It's just it, it just you just can go to the guy, you know, it, you just very approachable, mm -hmm. right? But me, it, it's like, could I develop more compassion with with more pra with more practice with God, with reading the Bible? Sure, but I don't have that that gift. He has that, right? And I just accept that the Lord may be rough. You know, it is what it is. You know, uh, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't be the guy that you first approach. And that's okay, because there's three different guys that Jesus kept around, right? So there's three different ones, you know, and, and uh, I needed to hear that, mm -hmm. because every time for me, it's like, like when I share the gospel, I, 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 I always just, I get rocks thrown at me. Like, not actual rocks, but I, it just, you just get angry. Mm -hmm. So... I needed to hear from that guy, and then another time, he said that my failures were uh, the will of God, right? So, it's not like God didn't know that I was going to fail, right? I, I, he knew that I was, that I was going to fail, and, and I began thinking that I'm, in, I'm at the right place at the right time. So, I went to, you know, it's, it's God convicts, so it's like, Go Sunday, right? And, and then you open up Thursday, and then I was like, all right, well, I'll go Thursday, right? And then, and then it was uh, the Lord's Supper, and that was the day I, I went here, Lord's Supper, sat in the back, and this is where you guys were doing the, the bread and the, and the wine, and then they were like, they never passed it to me. I was like, why are they not passing it to, to me? You know, they're not passing it to me, and I'm raising my hand, you know, and, and Stephen, you know, these, these are my two. Ones I consider brothers, Stephen and uh, Carlos, were just ignoring me. You know, I just like, why do they, they, I, I, I know they, they, they see my hand being raised, right? And it's just, you know, it's embarrassing. I was, I was, I was pissed. Uh, so, I, I, like, after service, <laughs> I, was, I came to here, and, and he saw me coming. He said, oh, Brother Manny, we just, uh, it's only members only. And then that even made me even angrier. I was like, I'm not, I, I've been coming here for like a, a, a year and a half. But not a member. He's like, no, you scripturally baptized. And at that time, I, you know, I was like, oh, you know, whatever, you know, I'm gonna leave out of here. Um, but I, I didn't see the thing. Even though I was ten years away from the church, it's not like I didn't learn anything. Like I learned that you know, correction comes from the Lord. The Lord corrects you, right? So that he, to set you in the right path, right? And that offenses will come, mm -hmm. right? But we forgive because the Lord forgave us of, of something greater. So. For me, it was, what is it that you want to show me? You want to show me something? And I completely, for, out of pride and arrogance, I, I missed out on what you wanted to show me. And, you know, I prayed about that. He gave me this book, which is, you know, and, and I, when I saw the book, it was, it's humbling. It's a blue book, blue binders, beginner's guide. I'm like, man, all right, I'll, I'll read this thing. 
And I went to the to the baptism one, and all he wanted to do was just add, he just wanted to add me to the church. That's that's it. Mm -hmm. And when I first saw that, because because and baptism came up in a YouTube channel, right? And I had time to watch baptism, but I just always skipped over it. Like this is something that I always skipped over. Um, and it's funny because I even missed the, the name, Baptist. You, you would think, yeah, they baptize it, right? You know, like, I missed the name, right? So, like, like uh, but it was, you know, it is what it is, you know. Um, and, that, and then I, I accepted it. I was like, all right, well, let's do this. We, we, did, we had our one-on-one. -on -one and, and the thing that I knew that it, this is the church for me is when pastor told me, hey, I don't really know what my gifts are yet. You know, I don't know what they are. Um, but he said, we're going to find them, and, we, and we're going to develop them. And you know what's funny about that? Because when I was having the, the wrestling with God, and God was telling me to go to church, I was like, I'll only go, I'll only go, and I'll only submit to someone who says that they will find my gift and develop it. And I'm like, there's no one next. You know, for me, I was like, there's no one. You're not going to get anyone. And, it, and it, so it was, it's right here. I was, I was in Browns Mill. It's, like, it's almost like uh, and there's a guy here that, that has a similar testimony to me. You know, it's just, it's just like it all connects. And that, when that happened and when God uh, told me about the, the adding to the church, I saw something that I, that I was doing wrong. Right, because he didn't, he wasn't answering me to he didn't answer because he was trying to show me something that I've been doing wrong the entire time, and that is that I was doing it my way, right? And my way is what got me, you know, it, my way sent me the wrong path. Mm -hmm. But Jesus's way, it, it would be it, it would be you have to do it the Lord's way, right? You have to approach church the Lord's way. You can't you can't just hide all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So. That was something uh, that, that struck hard. I was like, oh, that's why he didn't answer me. He didn't answer me because he wanted to show me, look, look at what you were doing. You were doing it your way. It didn't work. Come, come here. Do it. Let's do it my way. Mm -hmm. And I began to approach that way for the last, like, two months. And I'm not going to tell you everything that happened. But the Lord answered something that I, I prayed for 12 years ago. And I'm not, not going to tell you what that is, but it, it is kind of obvious. It's, you know, it, it's, it's seen, right? It is seen. And it, it, was, it was very encouraging because I forgot about what I, what I prayed for mm -hmm. 12 years ago. And to see it, to see it, in, 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 to see it done, it's something that it, 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 it fired me up. And it, it, it's going, uh, leaving going 100% in every area, right? And I, I, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, and uh, you know, just get it started. And that's uh, my uh, testimony. And is it? All right, Brother Manny, what a blessing. I really appreciate you sharing all that. That is a great blessing. This is Brother Manny. And uh, he stands before us. Um, testifying of his salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his desire to be a part of the New Testament Baptist Church, those that are members of this ministry, um, would you signify by saying amen that you would accept him to the membership of New Testament Baptist Church upon his baptism? And he opposed. Well, brother, we'll be baptizing you today and adding you to our membership, and uh, I am certainly looking forward to seeing what God's going to do in your life. Lord bless you, my brother. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the great grace that you've extended to us. And, Lord, it's wonderful to see how you work in our lives in so many different ways. And, and Lord, um, I just want to thank you for Brother Manny and thank you, Lord, for so much of his family being with us today. And I pray, Father, this day would be joyous for them also as they see this, um, this ordinance uh, being uh, practiced here this day as we baptize uh, Manny. I pray, Father, that uh, you'd receive honor and glory in your church as we honor you in this way, but honor and glory also, Lord, in Annie's life as he uh, is obedient to you in this, uh, this step of obedience and baptism, but also, Lord, in the future as you work through his life, as we see him grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to you be honor and glory in your church, dear Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord bless you, my brother. All righty, we're going to
uh, head to the back here in a second. Brother Jeremy is going to lead us in a couple songs, and uh, we're going to have baptism service, so please uh, uh, stick with us for just a few more minutes. Lord bless you, brother. Amen. All right, as they get ready for baptism, if you would, go ahead and stand with me, stretch your legs a little bit. We're going to go to page 140. We have an anchor, page 140. Just a couple more minutes here as we turn to page 266. And I'm going to keep glancing back there to see when they tell me to cut it, all right? So page 266, Honey in the Rock. I know everyone knows this one, so sing it out nice and loud, all right? My brother, do you know the Savior who is wondrous, kind, and true? He's a rock of your Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Pastor. Thank you, Brother Jeremy. Thank you all very much. Please be seated. Oh, what a blessing it is uh, to be here uh, as we practice this ordinance. Uh, Lord delivered them unto the churches, and that is, uh, He told us to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and uh, those that were saved, that we would baptize them and add unto the church, and that we would. That responsibility, of course, doesn't end there is we're also instructed to teach them to observe all things. And so that idea of evangelism, and that is then adding to those that are saved unto the church, and then, of course, discipleship, and to train and instruct them in the Word of God. And I'm so thankful that we have a ministry filled with people that desire to be instructed in the Word of God. And it makes my job as a pastor a whole lot easier when there's a hunger and thirst after righteousness amongst those that are part of our ministry. And so uh, today we're exercising one of the church's ordinances that she delivered unto the church. Brother Manny had mentioned about the Lord's Supper, and I remember that day very well as uh, we had to deal with that. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, grad I'm very glad that the Lord used that as a great instruction uh, into his life. Um, but the Lord's Supper, of course, is one of the ordinances. The second ordinance is that of baptism, and that, of course, we are, we are Baptists, and so we baptize, brother. That's a good observation. Yeah. The word baptize means to immerse. You can't baptize simply by sprinkling water on someone or pouring water over someone's head. 
The word baptism means to immerse. That means to submerge someone underneath the water. The reason that we do that is twofold. One, that it pictures, of course, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't do that any other way. The second thing that it does is it pictures what has taken place in our lives. That on the day that we got saved, we were buried with him, and then we are risen to walk in a newness of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we were in uh, when the waters of baptism, we are picturing what Christ has done. We are also picturing what has happened for us. We died with the Lord Jesus Christ. We were buried with him, and we are risen to walk in a newness of life. And, and Brother Manny is picturing this new life that he has in Christ Jesus as he's submitting to the waters of baptism. My brother, do you believe the Lord Jesus Christ has saved you? Yes. Amen. And you're willing to submit to this baptism today? Yes. All right. Come on over here. Get a good grip. All righty. Just want to say that it's a blessing to be able to stand here today and to exercise this ordinance. And my brother, I now baptize thee in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Buried with him and risen to walk in a newness of life. Amen. Lord bless you, my brother. My Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the wonderful grace that you've extended to Manny's life and, Lord, the grace that you've extended to us in giving us an opportunity of picturing this great picture of Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful, Lord God, that we can share in this moment together. Now, Father, I pray that your blessings would be upon him and that you would minister and strengthen him and help him, dear Father, to walk in a way that is worthy of the, of, of the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Bless Brother Manny and help him to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you, dear Father, for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Continue to pray and be a blessing to this man, all right? Lord bless you, my brother. You can head on up that way, all right? All right, let's all stand. We're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer. Thank you all for being uh, here. And um, we, uh, we had to be creative in filling the baptistry up. You know, we're doing some renovations downstairs, so all the water lines were cut to the back of the church house. So we literally ran a, ran a garden hose up the side and through the window to fill the baptistry up. Amen. Well, the baptistry's filled, and it's going to stay filled for a little while. I know there's several folks here that need scriptural baptism, and if uh, that's your desire to be baptized, please let me know. Uh, we'll keep this baptistry filled, and if we need to tap it off a little bit, it's easy to run the hose, okay? But uh, Lord bless you, and thank you for being here. We'll be dismissed with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll see you uh, on Thursday night for our prayer meeting and Bible study. If you want to remind the fellows about our work night on Tuesday, and other than that, it's been a joy to be in the Lord's house with you, and thank you so much. Brother Denny, if you would, sir, will you please uh, dismiss our assembly in prayer? Father, we thank you, Lord, that we were able to witness this, Lord, and uh, Manny's uh, just, uh, just being baptized. Father, we just thank you work in this young man's life, Father. And I just pray for him, Lord, that will grow in you, Lord. And uh, Father, we just pray, Lord, that will get involved with our church, Lord, and, and uh, use him in a mighty way, Father. I just pray for this, Lord. And I, I just pray, Lord, you just take everyone home safely today, Lord. Bring us back again, Lord, at the appointed time. And I just pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name.